Uh, certainly in the settled areas of Canada, it, we have to work with, with private landowners and we certainly accept land donations. We also enter into, into to, uh, conservation easements where basically we'll pay 30% of the fair market value of the land to protect those wetlands from drainage and, uh, and being broken into the future or uplands into being broken into the future. So we do work extensively with private landowners, but recognize as well, when you think of Canada as a whole, there's a heck of a lot more land in the north that is, that is crown land that is very wetland rich, whether it's peat bogs or fens or, or other, other flowages, wetlands associated with lakes. And we have an extensive boreal forest program that works right across the country with forestry, oil and gas, and uh, indigenous groups looking at ways to conserve and designate those, those northern wetlands on, on crown land. So it's a, it, it's a combined approach, but where the where the the, the uh, impact and conflict I hate to use the word conflict but I'll use it uh, on wetlands occurs is in the highly settled areas of the, the country to the greatest extent and trying to get in there and, and uh, work with landowners to restore wetlands that have been lost historically and uh, and protect those that remain that's certainly a focus of our of our program and the majority of that 6.4 million acres or 6.2 million acres sorry that i mentioned earlier would be through agreements and donations that i've, I've talked about the other 228 that would be crown land type agreements in the in the north so we call that influence because we don't we don't hold title to or have an agreement on that land per se like we would with a private landowner so influenced is the policy and, and industry partnership type work that we do, whereas the direct securement or direct impact is are the agreements, land purchase and, and conservation easements and those sorts of things. So yes, donation is, a, is, a, is an important part of our, our work and uh, we're happy to accept donations. Nonprofit, remember. Yeah, and each one has different challenges, of course, you know, so, and, and you know, you drive across the prairies and see all these little, what we call potholes or sloughs, people call them, you know, there's, even though they're isolated little pockets, quite often they're hugely interconnected hydrologically and how, how what you do to one has an impact to what that might happen to another two miles away. So understanding those, the connected, connectivity of wetlands across the landscape is another Another key piece that we, you know, I could get one of our scientists to go on on a boat for certainly another talk or two. The scientists probably go on longer than me, though. It might take three or four hours. But sorry. Yeah. <laughs>
uh, uh, interests and uh, and I think you know the progressive companies have recognized that and, and are willing to work with organizations like Ducks Unlimited to, to advance their their the term is uh, uh, envir environmental social governance you know the ESG I said e e EGS uh, environmental goods and services earlier but uh, ESG is a big thing for for a lot of corporations these days and even getting financial loans now quite often is tied to having a, a sustainable uh, approach to land use and sustainability does include uh, restoration. So I don't know whether I answered your question, but I think the world has changed, not just from a conservation perspective, but from an economic perspective where, where industry now has more pressure to operate in a sustainable manner than maybe they did even 10, 15, 25 years ago. Those are great questions. And, and in fact, uh, yeah, there are jobs. There's no question. One of our, our biggest challenges, though, as a nonprofit conservation organization is retention of young staff. We, we can attract them. They stay for a couple of years, then they go off and work for industry, which isn't a bad thing. From a selfish perspective, it's a bad thing because we don't retain those staff. But, but from an environmental education uh, perspective, getting people trained up to, to conservation values by working here a couple of years is a, is a good thing. Right now we have a number of openings across the company for, for everything from communication specialists to, to GIS specialists to managers of provincial operations. So within DU, there certainly are, are job opportunities. And, and uh, I, I think, uh, you know, it, it's a fairly rewarding career. I've been with Ducks Unlimited for 25 years. I started my career with DU back in 1997 in Brooks, Alberta worked in Edmonton for 11 years. The last eight years I've been here at uh, Okamak in, in Manitoba. So there are, are certainly uh, opportunities. And the, the thing that we're seeing too is, you know, the traditional uh, biology graduate is still important to us in terms of, uh, but we want to attract people with those economic backgrounds, with those communications backgrounds, because what I talked about here largely wasn't duck science or biological science. It's understanding those economic values and being able to communicate those economic values to industry and the general public that are, that are critical assets right now in terms of advancing conservation goals. And public advocacy, you know, someone that understands the political climates and, and how, to, how to work public policy. Those are other areas that are, that are critically important to us. Just, so just because you're not a, a duck biologist with a master's in, in duck biology from some wildlife school doesn't mean there isn't a career opportunity in conservation for you. Although I mean, you know, just having this dialogue today, I think it's a great first step. And, you know, I can certainly, we've got email contact now, I include you guys. There'll be a series of workshops, as I've said, they'll probably be hybrid, so you don't necessarily have to travel to Ottawa or the workshop is uh, over the course of the summer to talk about uh, um, the wetlands inventory, the, the wetlands policy framework. And, and those have generally been wide open forums. We, we bring in invited speakers, but uh, you know anyone with an interest in conservation is welcome to participate and, and uh, explore our website. More of that stuff will be put up on the website. Um, you know, from a conservation perspective, and from a DU perspective, there's, there's Ducks Unlimited, I use DU, I think you guys have got that, what that means now. But, um, you know, there's, there, there are fundraising events and, and uh, activities across the, across the country that, uh, that we could supply uh, more information on, should be interested to go to a dinner or learn more about the organization in that capacity. But, but I, I would say, you know, linking your group to the Canadian Wetlands Roundtable, where we get, could get some youth perspective on, I'm old, youth perspective, you guys are still young, um, on, on conservation and, and uh, sustainable development. I think that'd be, that'd be highly valued by the members of the roundtable. You know, I, I'm all about balance and I, I do believe that uh, 
that, you know, let, let's use that cattle example, you know, that's focused on methane emissions from cattle, but ignoring the other part of the equation, which is the extensive grasslands, those cattle use to live on, you know, to, to grow on versus uh, wall to wall cultivation of, of, of monoculture of soybeans and corn. So these things need to be brought into the equation because uh, just the emissions of producing corn and soya beans from various agricultural implements, you know, they're fairly high, but I, I think the, the public argument, whether it be through the media or, or uh, uh, you know, just general public knowledge is, is, is fairly uh, linear in terms of, okay, those emissions are bad, but they don't put it in perspective of what the whole enterprise takes and the costs and benefits to the environment of various enterprises. So I think clearly there has to be a better balance in the way people think about these activities whether it's raising cattle or growing soybeans. I mean, there's trade-offs everywhere and, and understanding how that works out in the balance when you're trying to pursue sustainability is a critical factor. Yeah. That's a, that's a good question. And it, it, the response has got to be variable because in invasive species that, you know, there's, there's plants, there's fish, there's snails, there's bugs, there's, there's all kinds of stuff. So each, each control is, is slightly different. I think ultimately, you know, having a well-balanced environment uh, is, a, is a key. We are involved with invasive species control. Uh, Phragmites is a marsh grass. It's an invasive from Europe that is, is decimating the uh, productivity of the Great Lakes marshes. Uh, there's a European water chestnut that's uh, invasive that's in Ontario and Quebec and, and causing great issues with with uh, with uh, with wetlands there. Spartina is an invasive species, a cord grass that grows in the, the, the coastal marshes of British Columbia. Again, we're actively uh, pulling up Spartina there. We're spraying Phragmites, you know, in in Ontario in, in conjunction with Nature Conservancy, Conservancy of Canada and other conservation organizations. You know, purple loosestrife was a problem back in the 80s when I started my career. Uh, through research, there were, were a strain of European beetles that were introduced. It was you know, a lot of testing to make sure they weren't going to impact other native species. And that's been a fairly successful uh, inroad into, into at least bringing purple loosestrife into balance. I don't think you're ever going to get rid of some of these invasive species. I think that's a that's a fool's pursuit, but to try and find ways to bring them into balance with with native species is is a is a huge challenge. They're they're experimenting with uh, with moths for Phragmites rather than spraying, which is probably a more ecologically uh, compatible way. But you know, in introducing other species to control invasive species is a problem. It's it's how do you control that invasion to begin with is is where you got to focus and. That becomes very difficult with you know sort of the global economy where you've got ships coming back and forth across the, the ocean and dumping their bilge in the Great Lakes. And as a result, you've got gobies and ruds and all kinds of other zebra mussels, which are now, I live on the Red River here. And, and when I first moved here eight years ago, there were no zebra mussels. Now, if you snag a rock when you're fishing, it's just encrusted in zebra mussels. Those things have exploded in, in Manitoba. And you know, we're trying to fight them from going into Saskatchewan and going into other lakes in Manitoba, but people are mobile, people have boats on trailers, people are moving around. Invasive species is a, is a real problem, and it, it's one that deserves a lot of attention, but the solutions quite often are not that easy once something's made its inroads, especially without upsetting other ecological functions. Oh, no, I think it's helped. Uh, we've just undergone our own, uh, hired a consulting firm and done our own uh, uh, carbon uh, analysis internally and, and with the plans that we conserved, uh, we're, we're very much in a positive, positive, positive place. But that doesn't mean just because you're positive, either you can't cut down uh, emissions through reducing travel rather than coming to Calgary, doing a talk like this, you know, all that, all that sort of thing. So we're always looking at, at ways of making things better. And then, then integrating um, wetlands and natural features as part of the offsetting for 
corporate organization, corporate corporations and organizations that are not in a positive place can really advance conservation of, of, of the land base. So there's a number of positives there. It's, again, it's challenging. We don't really have a good carbon market developed in Canada. We don't have consistent offsetting policies. But again, that's something that, you know, with that policy framework that I talked about the round table, we'd like to contribute to. We're not going to solve on our own necessarily, but overall, the, the zero base is a uh, is a great goal, uh, and uh, I think there have we have seen some positive outcomes, and we have seen wetlands position as a solution that wetlands and grasslands positioned as solutions that <clears throat> industry can can apply and conserve to to improve their carbon footprints. That, that, that's what we're wrestling with, with is this exercise uh, wetland evaluation, uh, or determining the value of wetlands to Canadians. So our first approach, and we're going to have a, a meeting, had a number of discussions, economists can't even agree on the best way to do it. So, you know, uh, there's figures out there that have been accused of being done with voodoo math. And there's other guys that would say that unless a wetland actually performs a function that produces a service that somebody receives, there's zero value. So that's the other extreme, you know? So trying to come up with a methodology that, that a cross section of environmental economists can support is our first step in, in doing that, uh, making that evaluation. But clearly, you know, when you look at tons of carbon that wetlands sequester uh, or, uh, you know, uh, amounts of phosphorus that they absorb, you know, we're able to take you know, the, the parts per million in the water column and, and translate that into bags of fertilizer uh, in, in a credible way. And, and then you can put an economic value on things. But the other thing is wetlands have such diverse value and functions, we may never be able to put an economic value on biodiversity. That, that's, that's pretty tough. Carbon sequestration, flood control, water quality, those sorts of things are a little easier. Uh, and certainly even the intrinsic value of wetlands, whether it may be to indigenous people or the rec aesthetic value of wetlands in, 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 in urban settings, those are things that, that are very, gonna be very difficult to, to put a value on. So it's safe to say, if we can identify several values and functions and translate that into an economic figure that economists can agree on the methodology, it's gonna be greatly conservative relative to the true values of wetlands out there, but at least it gets it moving in a place where you can argue that, you know, keeping that wetland is more important than producing another two acres of canola or whatever, whatever those things are. So that's the kind of scope that we're going to be working on. But trying to put it on, on, a, on a full economic analysis, no, I, I'm not, not suggesting we're going to be able to do that. But we can, based on science from 2003, when that $20 billion figure was, was estimated, do better now in terms of the, the existing science on, on various values and functions that have been enumerated to come up with a number that <clears throat> is probably a little more realistic and, and it'll be much higher than 20 billion a year. I told you. <laughs> I'll in a canoe. No. <laughs> No, I mean, some of the GIS work that we're doing, the, the remote sensing work, and, and then you couple that with, with the uh, environmental science and, and uh, knowing that this class of wetland can support so many tons of carbon per acre, that's pretty interesting stuff. And, and, and now, you know, and I don't pretend to understand this, but there's ways of doing this with uh, artificial intelligence from, from satellite photos and, and translating this sort of stuff. So back in the old day, people would be, digitizing aerial photographs and running all that stuff. And there's ways of doing this now with, with uh, even remote drones and, and other things that I don't pretend to understand, but it's pretty darn exciting to think that, you know, what might've been a multi-million, if not billion dollar effort to inventory wetlands in Canada 25 years ago might be able to do, be done more efficiently and more accurately for a fraction of the cost today. I went to a guy uh, in Louisiana a couple of weeks ago. I was down there on a, on a tour promoting what we do up here. And his whole company is flying drones on cell towers and other high towers. And he's developed algorithms that will identify rusty bolts and weak 
guy wires. And so nobody has to climb a tower anymore and they can, they can pinpoint the, until you actually go and replace the poles, I suppose. But, you know, this all used to be done by, by manual inspection. And uh, you think of the safety concerns and all the rest. Now you just have to go up and fix what's wrong. Now it's amazing. It's really amazing where we've gone and where we're going. That's just so impressive. Not there. So <laughs> yeah. impressive. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, even talking um, on the more people and others listening in, I mean, you know, well, we didn't even have a computer when I started. I mean, I can remember carrying punch cards across campus, like a thousand punch cards in a box to get it run through a computer and then going to another building to get the printout. And then realizing you had an error and having to walk around, around campus to do it over again. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know that uh, we have a true appreciation of just how streamlined our systems are these days. Yeah. We're pretty lucky. Awesome. I don't want to take up too much of your day here, but uh, I so appreciate you coming in. Um, really loved all of your points about collaboration between industries, um, the futures of wetland conservation and uh, the benefits just to environment and um, especially as we're looking towards net zero goals. So it was really, really awesome having you here today. Okay, well, thank you. I enjoyed it. It's sort of fun for my regular day job. So now I got to get back to that, I guess, unless we talk for another hour or two. But just kidding. It's uh, It's been great. And I appreciate connecting with your group. And I'm happy to keep that information flow from the round table going to you guys. And if you can participate in some of our activities, that'd be great. 100%. Thank you very much, Pat. We'd love to have you back again sometime too, to talk awesome. about the uh, talk about the rest of the stuff that you didn't have a chance to this this time. So, all right, appreciate it. Great to meet you all, and uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Pat. And you have a great day. It was a great talk. Great, thank you. Bye bye. Awesome. Thanks, everyone.